Good morning, Professor. Good morning. Good morning. Thank. Good morning, Zetlali. Good morning, Noelia. All right. Cool. Uh, good morning, Molly. Sorry. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Cool. <coughs> Excuse me. Good. Uh, good morning, Melissa. Good morning, Darina. Good morning, Luna. Good morning. Good morning, Professor. Good morning, Nikaya. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Good morning, Alyssa. Oh, my weekend was good. Thank you, Molly. Oh, ha uh, Molly. Good morning, Daniel. Oh, and happy spring, everybody. Like by every definition. I'm psyched about that. Oh, wait, did I just miss somebody? Sorry. Good morning. It is actually spring, like the vernal equinox, which is like a real thing, actually occurred two days ago. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, good morning, Catherine, I think. Good morning, Camilla, I think. Good morning, Antonio. Okay, I think I got every. Yes, good morning, guys. All right, cool, cool. Um, we, we can get rolling, I think. Yes, I think. Um, yeah. Oh, I, right. So I did some cleaning up of like the Google Classroom and everything, just like sorting around and stuff and catching up with grading. So one thing, if you got, I didn't mean to alarm anybody, if you got a, like if a new assignment came into your stream or you got notified of any game assignment, and if one was like due last week or something, that's not meant to be alarming or anything. Again, it's just that Technically, for every single class, you have an opportunity to hand in any record of even saying hello, <clears throat> and that offer never goes away. So I'm just keeping them. All. I know I've said this before, but it did alarm some people this weekend. Like, if there's any game assignment that was due in the past, it, it's due in the past just to tell you which day it's for, if that makes sense. So you can still at any time turn in any day that you have any record or memory of it, something you said, obviously, including today. So today's is due. 1.30, but the due times, don't get freaked by the, you know, okay, I think you understand what I'm saying, but any anything can still be handed in. And I think that at this point, anything that anybody has handed in has come back to them. I think anything and everything. So if you ever turned anything and you didn't get points for it, let me know. But I think everything is caught up. Um, which also means it'll probably be, oh yeah. Also reminder, we resolved this last week, right? We resolved the exam. You may want, let's just remind ourselves one more time right now or I'm re we're reconfirming like that our exam is until after break, right? So therefore I have not posted a practice exam or anything yet, but I'm, we agreed, did I put it in the, I don't think I put in the Google, you might want to remind me actually what we agreed, but we agreed, I know that the exam is after spring break. Actually, could someone remind me? Did we say, did anybody say? This is sort of an opportunity for point. Oh, thank you. April, thank you very much, Molly. Thank you. April 14th. Okay. Okay. So that means I'm just trying to remind myself. I'll put thank you. April 14th. I will. That means, and maybe if you guys could remind me again this Wednesday, but that means I will post something in Google Classroom just to remind you on April. I just flipped the calendar badly on on April. Oh. So right, April 2nd, actually, uh, I know someone's trying to come in. April 2nd, hold on, I'm gonna put in the chat right now. Believe. So I'm just, uh, I'm writing this in the chat right now just to be official and sort of to remind myself by the end of this class to officially put it in the Google Classroom and reminder to myself that and it's just so we can get rolling this week, right? So right now it is March 22nd. Right. So you'll have spring break and then April 2nd, which I guess is the end of your spring break, I'll post a practice exam. Um, just to remind you that doesn't count like that is a totally crucial document for your edification, but you, you, you never turn in a practice exam or get a grade on it or anything like that. Um, which is why, even though you're still on break when I post it, I mean, it's just for you to use. And then we'll go over it the following week. And then April 9th, I will post the exam and it'll be due the 14th. I'm just, again, I'm saying this part, partly to remind you all and to remind myself. Oh, and good morning, Sonia. I'm good. Thank you very much. I'm very happy it's spring. How are you? Um, okay. So, so that, 
I mean, you can answer or not. Okay. Um, so there's, st I still might um, uh, post one more quick homework between now and then, but right now there's still some homework problems to go over and you still can turn them in whether you did or not. But really there's like equations and concepts to work through now. We, uh, we're actually in, like crossing a hump in the material. I wanna ask you, I wanna deal with a couple of new equations, one of which we technically derived right at the end of last period, but I wanna do it a little bit slower. But also I wanna ask you guys, Sorry, I want to ask you, I think, yes, I want to ask you, pardon me, I want to ask you, I want to ask what lab, what are you up to in lab right now? If anybody could tell me in any way, like whether in the chat or in the private chat or with your voice, I'd love to hear what's going on in lab right now. Cool, cool. All right, I'm looking in the chat. Oh, and this is cool. By the way, oh, wow, there's a lot of responses. This is great. Keep the responses coming. I'm not even going to read them until I get a bunch. So don't worry if you say the same thing as somebody else. It's okay. I know it's such a weird thing, but like, I just, okay. Oh, cool, cool, cool. Oh, okay, this is very helpful. But keep them coming, even though I'm reading the chats now. But okay, good. I'm going to read it. Oh, 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 yes. Okay, okay, okay. Okay. Okay, this is very helpful. Oh, super nice. Okay, I see what you guys are saying. This is good. This is both. So I'm getting the facts and I'm getting sort of what you're getting out of it at the same time, which is very cool. I, I could easily go on a tangent and have a whole big discussion. And we will. At some point, we're just going to have a whole big sort of like round table class catch up discussion of lab and connecting it to lecture. I mean, we do that from time to time, but the, the, um, I won't go too in depth today. But okay, this is good for me to know that you're between lab three and lab four. I see what you're getting out of lab three and lab four. That's cool. Right. I mean, lab three is definitely about vectors, displacement vectors, addition of displacement vectors. It's about two dimensional space. Um, it definitely means as usual, you're, you know, what you're doing in lab is, is, is good. I mean, you're certainly not behind in lab um, and lab four, right. Is a further about two dimensional space, but not just displacement vectors, but velocity and acceleration vectors, those projectiles. But what is very good for me to hear from this, okay, this means that you've done lab two. Let me ask this, did you turn in, or what, this is what you're, is going, you're answering my question, what's going on in lab, and I appreciate it. As far as what you've ever turned in or gotten back, let's, either one, have you, what, what have you turned in regarding lab two? Like, did you turn in a formal report for lab two, the free fall lab? Let me see, I'm gonna look into the chat, although I think my chat just froze, oh, I'm sorry, hold on. But I see this. You turned it up. Ah, thank you. Yep. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Oh, lab three. Oh, this is all very helpful. Again, lab three is due tomorrow. We got back one and two. You got back. Oh, cool, cool, cool. Oh, cool. Yes. Okay. Right. They were. Okay. This is great. You've totally done lab two. All right. That means I'm free to talk very freely today about what I want. All right. So when I, so we're going to talk a lot more about acceleration and these equations. Okay. And you have seen them derive more than one way now. Um, but in today, when we're, I'm going to make a lot of references to free fall, and it looks like you totally have been through the free fall journey in lab, lab three is not tomorrow. Oh, you changed the deadline. Okay, okay, fair enough. But you, but what I'm really pleased to learn here is you are fully through the journey of lab two. It sounds like so, which doesn't mean I'm gonna, you know, I, I will still explain it my way and say my things, but it means I won't be um, ruining anybody's surprises or jumping any guns if I make references to it. Okay, this is very helpful. All right, um, so here's my deal. To get us back to our equations and our homeworks and stuff like that, what I wanna say so far, oh, ah, someone's here, pardon me. What I want, but this is very helpful. And again, any one of you who said anything in this chat just now about lab, definitely submit it for points, You know, double dip it, whatever. I'll open more portals if you think of more things. Um, because the point thing is really working. Like I got it. Well, I don't want to overemphasize it, but you know, there's enough of these portals now, and the 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 number of people that are turning in each one is like varying enough each time that like you could build a whole grade just out of these who's turning in these things or not if one wanted to. Um, but okay, I'm trying to I'm trying to go to the next page. What am I trying to do? Okay, I'm trying. Oh, I'm trying to let in. Okay, there. All right. 
I'm trying to say that everything we've done in physics so far in a way, like velocity, accelerate, and I'll rewrite the equations in a moment, but all these equations and stuff, in a way they all come down to this one thing that most people know if they do, if they live in the world at all, or if they do any science, people are very comfortable in a way with this idea of distance equals rate times time. And in a way, all of the physics we're doing just has to do with details and different versions of distance equals rate times time. Um, but, oh, good morning. No problem. No, no, no worries. No worries. Good morning. Good, good to see you. Good to see you. Um, the thing about distance equals rate times time is it's just true enough that it helps to think of it a lot in physics, like what we're doing to always bring things back to distance equals rate times time, because in a way, everybody knew that before this physics class. But in another way, it's really important for me at this juncture to sort of point out why you need a physics class. Like, what is it that we're doing that's actually hard or that you wouldn't think of on your own or that isn't captured by distance equals rate times time? Well, the whole thing is that everything in physics is about distances and times. Everything is about space and time. But rate means the relationship between space and time. And every new chapter in physics or every new detail we ever do or every new problem we solve is a new version of a new rate that we're discovering. Like in other words, there's tons of different rates in physics. And the study of physics is the study of these different rates in a way, or these different ways that space and time can be related for the motion, what we're tracking the motion of an object. So to be more specific, and I'm, what I wanna say is, distance does equal rate times time if by rate you mean average speed. Like in a way, the first month of this class is sort of devoted to, and I'm tempted to write this down, but I, yeah, I won't. Uh, yeah, actually, I'm going to write this down. Oh, whoa. I didn't mean to do that. Okay, to be as clear as I can be, what's true about saying distance equals rate times time is if by rate you mean average speed, if you know the average speed something's going and you know how much time it's traveling for, then you know how far it's gone. Yes, and that's an English way of saying this. Like that's what's true. Distance equals rate times time. If by rate you mean average speed, then what we're really saying that hooks up to physics is the definition of average speed is distance over time, or even better, the definition of average velocity is displacement over time, right? Like that's the physics way of saying that truth. But if the rate you're talking about is acceleration, then it's totally not true. And this is really where physics steps in, is physics steps in with the next rate, the rate not just of speed, but the rate of change of speed, not just the rate of change of position, but the rate of change of the rate of change of position with respect to time, right? Acceleration, like what I'm trying to say as strongly as possible is distance does not equal rate of acceleration times time. And so let's might as well write that. Like I'm saying distance does not equal rate of, or not even of average acceleration. It equals rate of average speed times time, but it does not equal rate of average acceleration times time. And, you know, it's sort of obvious. I mean, I say that, you might think like, well, right, why, why I never did think it was, did or something. But then what that means is if we have a typical situation, but acceleration is so important and so related to velocity that you can have a situation where you know the acceleration of something, the constant acceleration of something, and you know how much time is traveling for, but what you want is how far it went. And you can't just multiply acceleration times time to get that, like although people want to all the time. And the common case where this like comes up 
where we know the constant acceleration of something, like that, and that's the one thing we know. Like we don't know the velocity because it's always changing. We don't know the position because it's always changing, but we know the acceleration. The one case that that common, commonly comes up, as you see from lab two, is free fall. Um, I want to pause on this for a second. This is not the neatest, most legible board. So let me, so I want to, so, you know, we're all about acceleration right now in physics. I mean, even, even in your lab four, um, whether you're in lab three or lab four, like what we're all about now is the, the play between velocity and acceleration, like equations, problems we're solving, things we're doing in experiments. It's all about what's the relationship between velocity and acceleration. Um, now, and remember, specifically, the easiest way to look at that is to look at cases. What we're looking at is cases where we have a constant acceleration. That means a constant change in velocity, right? That means a change that's occurring, but not changing. But that's where we're, in calculus terms, that means we're looking at the second derivative, the rate of rate of change of position with respect to time. That's what we're looking at in physics right now again, and I'm gonna write an equation for them again, but we're looking at this second level of change, constant change, acceleration. Now the place we're finding this, I wanna pause, like especially the purpose of lab two in a big way, and I know lab two is a weird, it's like easy, but hard, but e like it's easy to do, but hard to understand. And we'll talk more in detail about it, but lab two is really meant to show you that free fall is the common natural, automatic, uh, automatically occurring uh, situation of constant change, of constant acceleration, not constant velocity, right? And this is very important again, like constant velocity would mean like cruise control. It'd be like a car going 30 miles an hour for a while, like say for an hour, in which case it would definitely travel 30 miles, right? Constant velocity is always traveling the same speed. But we're, in lab two, looking at things falling. And the reason that we're looking at things free falling is what we come to conclude in lab two in principle, since you've already done it, like I don't think I'm giving anything away or whatever, and we'll get, I'll try to explain more why, but we're supposedly learning from lab two or seeing or proving for your own eyes is that when things fall, they do change the rate when they fall, they do change their rate of motion, but they don't change their change in rate of motion. I'm gonna to have to say that again, but like all the business with the bolts and all this, like why some patterns of bolts work and others don't. And again, I'll try to put it on paper exactly like why, but what you're supposedly finding in that lab, you're not finding any special number. You're finding the reality that when things free fall, 
they do speed up, but they don't speed up the way in which they speed up, right? Um, so first of all, what do I mean by free fall? So we're studying, so free fall is a common case of, of, of constant acceleration. But what is free fall? Free fall, I wanna say from here on in as a definition, free fall as you were pretty much studying in lab two, in lab two, like a la, this is a la lab two, sorry, hold on. I mean, it's very, very much involved in lab four as well. Not, not so much in lab three, lab three is not, but. It, but lab two primarily is about free fall. And the definition of free fall that I'm lay, laying down is an, any object where there's no external influences or what you might call interactions or you might call forces. And I'll be more, we're, of course, we're going to learn about forces in a big way in this class. But before we even get to forces, let's talk about the absence of forces. I'm saying that what free fall is, if I, if I say, oh, that pen just was in free fall, what I specifically mean is that I don't see any other object of relevance, of, of any relevant size or anything like that. I don't see any other object in the universe interacting with that pen or influencing that pen or exerting a force on that pen, i.e. really what I'm saying is I don't see any other object or even surface or wall or anything or, or, or rope. I don't, it, I don't see any other object pushing or pulling, touching that pen at all, the only thing that I see influencing the pen is, is this pull, this supposed pull from supposedly the center of the earth, which I believe in only because I see all the time. Like, so what we mean by free fall is when you let objects alone and you don't you don't push them or pull them. You don't touch them. You don't have them on a table. You don't have them dangled from a fishing line. If an object is left entirely alone to its own devices, not touching any other object, what we find with experience is that such objects, if they're left totally alone, they fall towards the center of the earth. I'm not saying we know why yet. I'm not even, but, I'm, but we're saying that there seems to be this pull that seems to happen without touching, right? Which is very strange. Like any other time I ever want to influence an object, if I want to bring a pen toward me or push a pen away, like almost any other time you ever want to affect the motion of another object, you push or pull it through by touching it. Evidently, evidently, the center of the earth seems to pull all things near it to it without touching. We call this effect gravitation or gravitational or gravity. Like, I just want to be clear before we go any further, because gravity does, of course, become a very, very big subject of this class and of physics. Like, gravity is a very important phenomenon, but it's a very mysterious and very deep and complicated phenomenon. We don't want to, like, make any leaps about it. So we want to, so what's the deal with gravity? Like, how much can I expect you to know or what? I can only expect us to know gravity, what we can figure out about gravity thus far. Thus far, what we observe through our whole lives, like you and I, what people have observed for 2000 years, whether they carefully are observing with numbers or just sort of casually observing empirically, people observe that when you leave crap alone, it falls toward the ground, toward the center of the earth. <clears throat> I say the center because like you drop something and it falls to the ground. But if you go to Australia, you drop something, it also falls toward the ground. Like it, it doesn't go to the, you know, so everything is falling to, once you believe that the earth is round, Every, which all you have to do is see a horizon and you know, um, uh, things seem to all the time be pulled toward the center of the earth with a, with a pull that doesn't seem to require touching. We call that phenomenon gravitational pull from the center of the earth. Like we're, we're gonna get more deep into it, but all we know right now is we see that it happens. And then as of lab two, what you're finding is, oh, that pull, um, that pull toward the center of the ground that causes objects to, well, here.
So I want to I want to break that. I don't want to get into all the details of lab. I don't want to get into all the details of lab two at the moment, especially. I mean, you might be tired of it or whatever. But just <clears throat> let's just break down some basics for a second. You're dropping stuff in lab two. I know you're dropping complicated strings with like bolts tied on them. And I know you're not even actually doing that because it's a simulate because you're in Zoom and I don't even know what, but you're dropping something. And the first thing to note when you drop something is when you drop something, it moves, it falls, it has a velocity, right? Like it's covering some amount of displacement in some amount of time. It was here, now it's there. So it has a velocity, anything when it falls, right? I don't know what the velocity is, but I know it has one. But then note this, when things fall, it's not just that they have a velocity, it's that they do have a changing velocity. When something falls necessarily, automatically, I can tell you, and you, this was meant to be part of lab two, whether you like actually noticed it or thought it, wrote it down or remembered it or not, but, but note this, that when you drop something, initially it's at velocity zero. Like if you drop it, not throw it, if you drop it, you let it go out of your hands, so one minute it's in your hand, sitting there in the, in the air. Then you open your hand and the thing drops out. So something had a velocity of zero while it was in your hand. Now it's moving. So it's velocity definitely changed, right? Like even if we don't have any measuring equipment or any precise numbers, when something falls, at the very least, its velocity goes from zero to something greater than zero. So necessarily when things fall, they not only have a velocity, but they have a changing velocity, which means they have an acceleration, right? And again, please remember, not all things that move have acceleration. If something moves at a constant velocity, it has an acceleration of zero. But when something falls, we're saying it doesn't fall at constant velocity. It changes its velocity at least from zero to something. So therefore, in free fall, so when something falls, it accelerates for sure. Like this is like a premise of lab two. Again, you don't even have to put bolts on the string. Well, and you re well, you really do verify this with that first string that you drop when all the bolts are equally spaced and the sound goes da 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 da. Like it really verifies this, but it's it, it it's it's true even before that moment when something free falls. It has. An acceleration, right? So when something falls, it not only gains space, but it gains speed. And again, I know you know this, but let's just try. We're trying to guide, like do one like rate at a time, or one like level of change at a time. We're trying to analyze, and especially if you're sort of comfortable with calculus, you know that what we're really talking about, or well, and actually based on this class, you know that what we're really talking about are derivatives here. So so far, I'm saying that from simple observation. When something free falls, automatically it's got a first derivative of position with respect to time. But automatically, if you're thinking about it, you realize it automatically has a second derivative of position with respect to time. So like, in other words, What we're saying is necessarily if something free falls, it has a first derivative, which is non-zero. It's motion can be described with a first derivative that's non-zero. It has a second derivative, which is non-zero, like it has acceleration. But now, if you really did work through lab two, and I don't mean this in a challenging way, but I mean this as a, like trying to tie things together way, the real issue of lab two, the real purpose of all this weird, like where are the bolts to make it work out in even time is that when you're when all is said and done, some bolt patterns work and others don't like work, like produce steady time rhythm and others don't. Again, I'm talking about for anybody's tuning in, I'm talking about lab two here. The reason that in principle, a certain arrangement of bolts will produce steady time. And that arrangement, for example, is like putting the bolts at one, four, nine, 16, 25, for example, and other arrangements won't work even arrangements that really seem like they work, like bolts getting farther, like everybody, okay, I'm getting all over, but like even a string like this, putting the bolts at one, two, four, eight, 16, 32, right? Some people, again, I didn't have a big discussion with y'all. I wasn't there. I don't know what you thought individually. I kind of do want to know, but I'm, I'm kind of scared too at the moment. 
What I'm saying is, generally speaking, a lot of people have, who are getting what's going on in that lab while they're doing it are like, oh, I get it. When things fall, they're speeding up, they're getting faster and faster. So if I want these bolts to all hit the ground at the same time, you know, in equal time intervals, I better make them like farther and farther apart from each other, like not just far, but farther and farther apart. So a lot of people, a lot of semesters will come up with like the very clever, smart, reasonable plan of putting, like doubling the distance every bolt, something like that. So putting a bolt, like one bolt here at one and putting the next bolt here at like two centimeters or inches or whatever, and then putting another bolt at four and then putting one at eight and then 16. Now that seems really wise. It like makes sense on every conceptual level, except the numbers don't work. That bolt won't actually produce steady rhythm. Again, this is in lab two. It turns out that only certain strings, it's like you, you have to be a more specific pattern than that, not just like doubling, but a pattern like perfect squares, like one, four, nine, 16, 25. That one works. Why or why are we looking at all this? Because what lab two is actually trying to show, if you really reason it backwards and think about which patterns work and which don't, what we're trying to say in lab three, two is that this is important. We're like, like in the calculus part of our brain, we're saying, let's start considering derivatives, people. Let's consider rates of space versus time, because we're physicists, we're looking at things moving through space and time. So now calculus gives us, or mathematical ways of thinking give us this way of thinking about, oh yeah, ratios, like slopes, like, oh yeah, like as the clock ticks along on the x-axis, we're getting thus and thus far on the y-axis. So we can think of like slope as a rate and then slope of slope of that concavity as a rate, rate, rate. Math gives us the ability to say, let's look at the first derivative, the rate of change. Let's look at the second, the rate of the rate. Let's look at the third. We could keep going on forever mathematically. Physics is saying, hold on. It's saying, yes, yes. Understand that pattern. Understand that one rate is to the next rate as the last weight rate was to the next one. Like it is a pattern. But physics is saying, if you actually look into the world around at least planet Earth, we the a natural motion of free falling, like the most kind of natural automatic motion we could think of, because any other motion, the things just sit still. Like free fall has it automatically delivers us a measurable first derivative of velocity and a measurable second derivative, which is acceleration. But but because certain string bolts worked and uh, string patterns for bolts worked and others didn't, we conclude that gravity, free fall, doesn't just give us acceleration, it gives us constant acceleration. It gives us a change in a change which doesn't change. It gives us change on level number two, which is why we have to know that much calculus because we have to understand derivatives well enough to take a derivative of a derivative. Like we're going that far with this, but then we stop not because we're wimps or because we don't want to learn any more math, but because nature says, because as scientists, we like study free fall and we're like, oh, there's a change in the change, but there's no change in the change in the change. It is constant acceleration. Okay, and it turns out, it turns out what you also do maybe hopefully pick up from lab three, but which is like,
Okay. Before I go any further, so I'm saying that the real takeaway of lab two is just that acceleration under free fall is a constant, that A equals A naught. That's really the takeaway of lab two, that what we get due to free fall is an automatic situation and a reliable situation of constant change, of constant second derivative, i.e. zero third derivative. Like that's the takeaway of lab two is what I know I'm being very repetitive, but I'm trying to say as clearly as possible. Yet there's like an addendum or like an ex, um, like, like um, icing on the cake, um, insult to our injury is that we also do get a number out of lab two, sure. And we're gonna use that number a lot for the rest of all of our lives in physics. But what the number that we get, the constant, what we're gonna call lowercase g, that number tells us a lot, only assuming that we, it, it tells us what to do as long as we're assuming meters, kilograms, and seconds. It says that the rate that things tend to fall, the rate of acceleration toward which, at which things fall to the ground naturally, if they're near the surface of the earth, is approximately 9.81 meters per second squared. Like this is an acceleration, right? Not a velocity. So, the, and you can memorize this, but you also don't have to. Like I, you'll, you'll automatically, if you already didn't, you'll automatically just remember this number for the rest of your life if you already don't. And I put it on every exam that you need, whatever. But it, it is super commonly important, but it's not, you know, the, the point is that it's a rate of acceleration that's constant. That when something falls, we can reliably say that after one second, it'll achieve a instantaneous velocity of like 9.81 meters per second. And therefore at the next moment, it'll have a velocity of 19.62 meters per second, et cetera, et cetera. Now here's the thing, please note, please put in your notes. I didn't put a plus or minus sign here. That totally depends on what coordinate system you choose. Like sometimes we make this thing negative, sometimes we make it positive. That depends on context. That is up to us. That's not a thing that's not built in to the rate. Um, you'll see that. Um, second of all, even when I say 9.81, that all sounds very exact and everything, but that is already me chop. It's important that I say this, especially because we're all scientists. When I say 9.81, that's already chopping off dis digits which I have to do no matter what, because the actual number, if you want to know the actual number, it is a transcendental number. It is an infinite decimal expansion that goes on without repeat or pattern, like pi or like Planck's constant or like E or like many of these other numbers that in fact are far more common than numbers that don't do that. Okay, it's actually, it's sort of interesting, but not at all uncommon that the actual number for G goes on forever without repeat and it's only even correct, even if you went to all those digits, they would only be correct at a very precise height above Earth's surface. Like if you go to the top of the Empire State Building already, the number has changed fairly wildly. I'm saying all that, because this is like our first piece of knowledge in this class, actually. Like we have some equations, but they're all definitions are based on logic. They're, now we have some knowledge kind of from lab two, like you did stuff that leads us in principle to actually say, once we introduce stopwatches and rulers into our lives, that things fall at this numerical rate. I got to tell you, in fact, okay, I'm going to tell you, like formally.
just to so you know the number nine like you you don't you're not going to get it exactly in a lab uh, with ex with any kind of normal measuring equipment because the number itself does go on forever without repeat or pattern which means no matter what we ever write down we're chopping off digits and making an approximation which is totally okay because all measuring, I mean, we're approximating to the number of digits that any of our measuring equipment goes. And that's what it means to be a scientist, not a mathematician, L comma, like for real, comma, yo, period. But I'm saying all this because if the number G, if we're gonna, I don't, I wanna get hung up in the constancy and reliability of it. I don't wanna get hung up in the exact digits of it because we're chopping off digits no matter what, number one. Number two, the digits only represent what choice of units we've made. That is, whoa, hello. Uh... So the first thing I want to, so I'm saying a couple of things at once. One is no matter what, we're chopping off digits. Number two, if why the number is nine, why the number um, is 9.81 or 9.8, like, is that a coincidence or where did that come from? Or is it special? Well, like, no, totally not special. Didn't come from anywhere interesting. 9.81 is just what we get when we decide to measure in meters and seconds or meters per second per second. If we decide to measure in feet, then the gravitational constant is 32. And that's just as accurate, right? It, it literally is just as accurate. Or if I'd said 32.0, it would be just as accurate. Now that's in feet. Now what is that? And that, that might be easier for some of us to relate to. When I say it's 32 feet what, per second squared, what I mean is if you drop something from rest, at the end of the first second, it's going 32 feet per second. At the end of the next second, it's going 64. At the end of the next, it's going 96. Like, like not 128, right? But like 96. And it, like it's 32 more feet per second of speed every second is what that means. Might be easier to relate to, might be not. This other one might be the most easy to relate to even though you never heard it before maybe. It's a totally valid unit conversion. If you, if you just do the unit conversion, you can express G as 22. And there's actually a homework problem. We may do a homework problem on this. There, uh, as uh, 22 miles per hour, per second, meaning if you drop something. Again, all of these are equivalent ways to describe one and the same truth, a truth that in principle you were picking up on in lab two, uh, like, or at least lab two is meant to be feeding this idea that when you drop something, you can't rely on like how fast it's gonna go because it's gonna go faster and faster every moment. But you can rely on the rate at which it's gaining speed. Like that's a big piece of knowledge. It's not the same as knowing its speed, but it's a, but it gets you there. What we know when you drop something is if you were to think of it as having a little speedometer needle inside, like a car speedometer, if you drop something, whether it's a tennis ball or a car or a brick or a brick house, like you drop something from rest, like you drop it in one second, it'll be going 22 miles per hour. That is what I'm saying here. If that helps you relate, like one, like go drop one Mississippi. It's now going at 22 miles per hour go one Mississippi again, like down to two Mississippi, like let it fall for two full seconds. It's now going 44 miles per hour. Let it fall for three seconds. It's now going 66 miles per hour, like a car on the highway. Like it just takes something three seconds to get up to highway speeds. That's what I'm saying. Like all these numbers are equivalent. So they're not special numbers. They're just like representations of what units we're measuring in. And all of them are approximate. They're not exactly true because the decimal expansion goes on forever. But since they're, we're approximating anyway, since we're just chopping off digits to wherever's convenient for our instrumentation, then most conveniently of all, most commonly you'll find in this class and in physics, like throughout the world, like whether you're a student or a teacher, like the way we all tend to treat gravity is like this. I just want to get this out of the way before we, like, 
for the rest of this semester and another semester, if you take physics 204, God bless, I hope you do with me, I'll see you, that'd be great. Like we're gonna, when, when in doubt, whenever there's a number at all, we're just gonna call gravity 10. We're gonna call the acceleration, the constant acceleration due to gravity, due to free fall, when in doubt or when otherwise not specified or whatever, we're gonna call it 10. And we are rounding 9.8 when we do that, but 9.8 was rounded in the first place is kind of a big part of what I'm trying to say here. Like we're all scientists, but we don't wanna get hung up on the wrong things. In general, we can rely on this nice round juicy number of 10 as representation of how fast things accelerate when they fall. Now I'm gonna, I'm saying a lot in a way, or I'm saying nothing in a way, all of this dwelling on that I'm doing here is the naturally occurring, prevalent, common um, scenario called free fall. We love to look at free fall. Okay. Okay, so just so we're sort of in the middle of free fall now, obsessing about free fall. Again, it sort of gets suspended in lab three. You're not really concerned. You're not at all concerned with acceleration in lab three. I recognize that lab three is really about vectors, but then it comes back in lab four in a big way. This except so you're going to be hearing about free fall sort of like for the rest of your physics life. Why? What's the big deal? What's supposed to go through your brain where you think about free fall is first and foremost. We're we're turning to free fall as our natural lab arena for studying constant acceleration. A huge amount of physics has to do with constant acceleration. Again, unchanging change, unchanging change. Free fall is slap in the face demonstration of that. We're like excited to report as physicists. Like you, you get automatic constant change if you just drop something and the numbers all work out and all the math. And so that's one reason we look at free fall all the time because it's a way of measuring constant acceleration, unchanging change. But the other reason we look at free fall all the time, the other reason is that free fall
once again, I've, I always, the most important things are always at the end for me. So those get squeezed. So you probably have to write this differently in your notes. What I'm trying to say here, the second super important thing about free fall that will come around and around like through physics 203 and physics 204. The other like feature of free fall that makes it so important is that it is a glaring exception to a certain, to a very important rule of physics, a rule that we haven't yet fully developed, but we're going to develop. So I want to let you know now, like there, there's this idea in physics of interactions of like, like right now, of like how one object affects another object, how one object gets another object to change its motion. Right now we're saying in physics, remember we're saying that things don't have motion in and of themselves. Velocity is a relationship between two objects, right? That's, what we, that's a big part of train of thought and planet earth moving and all that stuff. Well, how does one object ever affect the velocity of another? How does one object interact with another object? We're eventually gonna use the word force for that. Force is the word that soon we're gonna start using in physics for, for the phenomenon of one object interacting with another and thereby affecting its velocity or its acceleration, et cetera. Well, the thing is in physics, the most easy way to see how one object interacts with another is when one object touches another, when it makes physical contact with another. That's the most obvious, clear demonstration of one object messing with another object's velocity. It would almost be impossible. It's such a natural way to understand objects interacting. In other words, I'm saying there's a rule in physics. There's an association, an otherwise ironclad association in physics. Down at the bottom of the page, it says interaction or force, whichever word you like better, basically. They mean the same thing. If you want to think that one object is interacting with another or that one object is forcing another to do something, in physics, look for whether they're touching each other or not. If two objects are interacting, they're probably touching. If two objects are touching, they're definitely interacting in, phys in the world of masses in space and time. If you want one mass to affect the other, try to bang them into each other and you'll like two cars crashing, you'll see they affect each other. That's such a, an ironclad rule that it would even be, it would be obvious and not worth pointing out were it not for this exception that exists to that rule. And this exception is so glaring that we wouldn't actually believe it at all were it not for the fact that it's everywhere. And that exception is gravity. Like I just, I need to pause and like talk about like why we start talking about gravity right from the get-go in physics because it is everywhere around us. Because what seems evident like from the time you're a baby is that stuff falls automatically. So we get so used to it, we know it's true. Like there is a phenomenon called gravity, crap falls. But I need to constantly remind us that like, we know that so well that we don't doubt it, but realize that's like almost all we know about it to a certain stage. Like when we say that things fall, what we're saying to ourselves is things are automatically pulled to the ground, even though the ground is not touching them. That's a very weird thing to believe about objects. We wouldn't, we never believe it in any other case except for this one, because it's always happening. Like, well, in any other mechanical case, I mean, there's things called magnets and stuff like that, but in, in mechanical physics, we're never gonna see a case again in mechanical physics where, where something can pull something else without touching it. The only case is gravity. And we only believe in gravity because we see it all the time. It doesn't actually make any obvious sense right away why things are falling to earth all the time, but they apparently are. So the second reason we study gravity is to try to get at what does it mean that there's this interaction that's happening without touching? Why does earth have this special property? Like that's what we have to get into and stuff. Or what does it mean that it looks like earth has a special property? But all I'm saying right now is it is special because all other interactions come from touching, all other mechanical interactions, all right? So these are the two things about free fall. Okay, what time is it? I know I'm totally babbling. I meant for there to be more talking today amongst you guys. I'm really, I'm saying way too much. Uh, but I want to do, I do want to bring this back to the equations though. So. Um, Okay, so, well, yes, I'll do both. Of them. So,
Okay. Now, I know I've been talking a lot and sort of very abstractly. I've been trying to talk about free fall because free fall is our scenario, our, our arena for constant acceleration. I'm trying to emphasize constant acceleration because like that's what we're doing in the class right now. But now to bring this back like to the homework and the equations and stuff like that, and to distance equals rate times time, here's what I'm saying now. It's like what gravity presents us with all the time, what free fall presents us with is an automatic situation of kind of like, it tells us the time and it tells us the rate. And we are now in a position where we could easily predict the distance, right? Like, like gravity gives us these sort of facts where it says to us, here's a time, here's a rate. What's the distance? And what I want to tell you all is here's where physics comes in, because the kind of rate that gravity tells us is not a rate of velocity. It's a rate. Like, it, it's not. It may seem like it, but it's not. It's a rate of acceleration. So, for example, I can literally say, and this is what we're about to do. I am going to shut up and turn it to you guys for like 15 minutes. I can say, I drop a rock near the surface of the earth. Like I drop a bolt, I drop a Hershey kiss, I drop a, like a can of Coke, a, a tennis ball. I, I, I just, I drop a random object and I drop it. Let me make that super clear. I drop it, like I don't throw it or anything like that. Like, and I'm not saying we can't do the physics if I throw an object or something, but just one step at a time, right? So I'm saying if I drop an object, so I just say that phrase, I dropped an object. Automatically right there, that means initial velocity is zero meters per second, right? Initial instantaneous velocity, not V bar, not V final, but V naught is zero if I dropped it. And I could walk right up to you and just say that much. I dropped an object. How far does it fall in five seconds, right? I could say that as a person or as a physics professor, I could say I dropped something, it free fell, it went into free fall, or it free fell from rest. How far did it free fall in five seconds? Now that's a valid question from here on. I don't have to give any other information because what we're, because we're not, now, because you have a rate and you have a time, the rate, sure, if I say I drop it, it means the initial velocity was zero, meters per second. But more importantly, if I say it's free fall, if I say it's free fall, then what we automatically know is that the acceleration down is a constant. It doesn't change that acceleration down. And we know that that number pointing down is approximately 10 meters per second squared. Like from, again, you wouldn't have to memorize it right at the beginning of a test, but it, you will memorize it. If something's in free fall, automatically accelerating at a rate of approximately 10 meters per second squared. So I can, and here's where I'm about to get obnoxious. We have like, we have like 13 minutes. I've said a lot, but here's the problem on the table. If I just literally say to you, how far does an object drop in five seconds? I think you can get it. I think you could either do it in your head or you can use equations. You could do it on paper. You can get the answer. But I think the first thing to recognize is the answer is not 50, right? This is, in other words, here's where it's physics. It's, it is distant, in other words, don't do distance equals rate times time, because the kind of rate we have here is an acceleration rate. So it would be too simplistic and wrong to say that this object fell 50 meters, but you can get how far it fell. And you can get it without plugging into any unfamiliar or magic, black magic equation. And maybe I, so I'm gonna pause and ask, can you all try to get the answer? Like I'm asking, how far does it fall if it fell for five seconds at a constant? And you, you don't have to use negative signs or anything. Everything's going in one direction. So everything is, you can call down positive. Everything that goes down, you can call positive and nothing's ever gonna go up in this problem. But if I'm letting something free fall for five seconds, I wanna know how far it falls and um, the lots that I want to know from anybody or everybody in the chat, and I'll pause for a second. We do have like 12 minutes so we can get, and I want you to, I mean, eventually, well, yeah. So that's what I want to know how, I'll say it again on the next. But take your time, but, and again, put whatever you want in the chat, private or public. I'm not going to say if it's right or wrong. So tons of you could put the same thing in the chat and it's okay, but I'll repeat the question on the next. And I know we have limited time, but I think we, this is off grid, like this is not literally a homework. This is the cycle problem. 
it is the first second problem just dressed up in different form but um i'll say it again on this page but i would like people to try to answer this before we go today because i know i've talked way too much so again here's the problem free fall from rest how far will the object free fall from rest in five seconds like i am trying to emphasize this is an example of physics i don't think this is easy but i think it's sort of remarkable that physics can be this simple and straightforward like literally i can just say how far does an object fall from rest in five seconds. And there's totally an answer to this. And it won't matter what the object is, the answer is correct. And the answer is not a memorization thing, like, because I could change it and say, okay, how about in seven seconds? How about in 13 seconds? And once you get it, you get it, and you could totally answer this. And yes, some of you might even be plugging into some equation that has squares in it or something, but I actually think it makes more sense than even just those. But this is the question I'm asking everybody, right? And what, like this is what I'm asking, how far will an object free fall from rest in five seconds? What that translates into mathematically, I'm asking assume, in other words, given what's given is A is a constant, which is 10, which is approximately 10 meters per second squared. The initial V is zero meters per second. And the time is five seconds and I wanna know what the x like how far the thing falls like that's the question i'm asking but i am trying to emphasize that um you know i could change the five to step once you get how to do this I, I could change the five to anything and you'd still know how to do it and it and it's not from any new equations it's from the equations we have like just the definition of acceleration velocity displacement in fact because we still have nine minutes and I would like you guys to try this. And I'm assuming that you are hearing me, but maybe gun shy or whatever. So on the next page, I'm gonna again, write the equations that you can use, that we have, that you can use. Um, two of them are definitions of the derivative. I wouldn't even use them for this anyway. So I'll, but you can get this. Um, and you ultimately, you want to totally know how to get this. But and again, if there was a little bit more time, I would stop and just ask everybody, do you even hear me? I think you do. You all, just raise your hand electronically if you acknowledge that there's a question I'm asking. You may not have an answer, may not want to say anything, but just, could you just electronically raise your hand if you're hearing me right now and you understand that I'm at, okay, cool. Thank you, Nikaya. That's good enough for me. Okay, thank you, Alyssa. Thank you, Nikaya. All right, at least that's two people, but okay. Thank you, Molly. All right, that. thank you, Doreen. All right, so I'm going to try to write it. And thank you, Camilla. All right, I, I, I'm convinced now. So I'm going to, again, I would like you guys to try. So I'm going to write equations on the next page advising how to do this. But what this is, if, if we had more time right now, I would say, look back at your notes from last time, from when we went over the problem called the first second. Like, and again, I rushed something at the end with a bunch of equations, but I'm not even asking you. I'm, this is all my attempt to redo that slow, more slowly. So I'm just saying, look at how, if you look at that problem from homework number, from homework number five, which again, some of you have done, some of you have not, but we did go over last time the problem called the first second, which has a bicycle starting from rest and accelerating at a constant rate of two. And it does so for one second. We find out how far it's going. I'm, this is just that, this is the same type of problem. Oh, and I don't know if, if Camilla actually has a, I'm sorry, a thank you. This is, oh, thank you. That's awesome. Um, you would solve this problem the same way, only here it's not one second, it's five seconds, and the acceleration is not two. Oh, and Camilla, do you have a question or are you raising your hand because I asked you to before? Oh, sorry. Or maybe because I asked before. Okay. Um, well, anyway, so, so I'm asking the same thing here, so I'll, I'll say this.
in principle, oh, let me look in the chat. Oh, okay, thank you. Sorry, okay, thank you. I appreciate it, sorry about that, okay. Um, okay. Uh, so in principle, these are the four equations we've had for a while, like two are definite, well, they're all definitions, but then the one thing we developed, I guess the, again, I am aware that there's six minutes left. So, and I'm also aware just from people's responses, I think I have been sort of babbling abstractly too much, but the concrete thing that I'm trying to bring this back to here where we'll pick up on Wednesday is the most recent equation that we developed, the most recent, the, the, the most recent piece of new knowledge is this right here. In principle, this came out of last discussion this equation is the one, and it is, it's the most recent, it is the hardest in a way to manage this equation. Because notice again, it is, it is the first equation of all of them that is not a triple equal sign. So it's the first equation we have that isn't necessarily always true. It's only sometimes true. In fact, I should have given it space when I wrote it, sorry. I mean, it's right, it's not wrong, but let me just move it down the page a little bit. This equation that we got last time, this equation that we got last time, which says in English, in a way, it says sometimes the average velocity is the average of the first and last velocities, right? Like up top, our definition of average velocity, up top equation number absolute one, our definition of average velocity is displacement per time. Total, how far you got in what direction per how much time elapsed. That's what average velocity is. Now down here, we're saying sometimes double equal sign, sometimes the average velocity is also the average of velocities, the first and the last added together, those two of them added together and divided by two, like averaged, right? This most recent equation is saying sometimes the average velocity is the average of the velocities, but only sometimes. when's the sometime, the key, like what binds this whole lesson together? The sometime is if and only if acceleration is a constant example free fall like this most recent equation that we got last wednesday that we got from thinking about averages this most recent equation that we got from looking at that problem we have different lists of numbers and like and like antonio pointed out that one of them wasn't linear and that whole business like the whole thing of that whole lesson was noticing, ah, as long as velocities are changing in a constant way, then the mean velocity will be the median velocity. Then the average for the whole interval will be the same as the instantaneous right in the middle. Like this is a major insight because it's only sometimes true. The sometimes is as long as velocities are changing at a constant rate, then and only then, the mean velocity, the average velocity will be the median velocity, the instantaneous velocity right in the middle. Then, and only then, you can get average velocity by taking the first and the last for an interval and adding together and divided by two because all the velocities are changing at a constant rate. So if acceleration is a constant, then this equation applies. When is acceleration a constant? Most commonly, free fall. So if we, so, the, so if we want to do an example like the one I'm doing right here. I'm going to do this really fast. We have three minutes. I'm going to do the answer, I guess, even though I, uh, yeah. Like, so if we just want a straightforward problem like free fall, like something here, we have, we have V naught equals zero. We have T equals five. We have A equals 10, right? That is a situation here. And I know we have, again, we have, based on the equations that I have so far, I can say, oh, like distance equals rate times time. Yeah, distance equals rate times time, not rate of acceleration. No, this thing's not gonna go 50. Distance equals rate average velocity times time, right? That, that's what I can say. And the average velocity is the first velocity zero plus the last velocity. What's the last velocity? Oh, that's what's 50. The last velocity is 10 times five, like 10 times five, I know we have one minute. But... Wait, 
like if we do v equals 10 times 5 what we're getting what that 50 is is the hot is the maximum velocity this thing achieves like it's gaining the speed of 10 meters per second every second so at the fifth second it now has 50 meters per second of speed yes like that like the 50 that everybody wants to do 5 times 10 means something but it doesn't mean how far this thing got it means how fast this thing has gotten by the end and at the beginning it was only going zero very good yes I, the person who's um, yes there's only one minute but, and give yourself 75 points for that please the person who's in the private chat with that number yes that's awesome um um, um we're saying this is how fast it's going on average for five seconds. So as a person just put in the private chat, we're saying that this thing is like an object that was going on average 25 meters per second, on average 25, because at the beginning it was going zero and at the end it was going 50. So on average 25, four, five seconds. So the answer to this would be a hunt, as somebody put in, and that's really awesome, 125 meters. Like it's the, how far did something fall in five seconds where it's gaining a speed of 10 every second? Like the key lesson today, like is like falls for five and we're, we're gonna pick up right on this on Wednesday. I'm gonna ask you right away when we walk in like, okay, something falls for seven seconds. How far does it go? And like, if I say seven seconds, you don't go, oh, seven times 10, it goes 70. You go, oh, seven times 10, 70. So it's going 70 meters per second by the end. So on average, it's going 35. So it goes 35 times seven, that's 245. That's what you do. Now, maybe you can't do that arithmetic, in your head, but you follow me. I think everybody does. You have to go to another class. I have another class coming and start it. But I think at least one, I'm very proud of, at least one person put this in the chat and I know all of you are being polite. So probably all of you got it. I think you all have it now. I'm gonna stop. Um, no new homework or anything. I, I, very cool. Are we, I, I'm good if you're good. I'm saying goodbye and I'll post all of this, but bye. See you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. See you. Okay. Awesome. See you. Good time. Bye, Professor. Bye. Thank you. Awesome. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Okay. Oh, I like to make sense. Thank you. Okay. That's cool. Okay. Awesome. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Awesome. Awesome. Cool. Bye. Bye. Good job. Bye, Noel. Awesome. Thank you. Bye. And you guys are good, Asia and Antonio. You guys are good. Thank you so much, you guys.